Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Slava, for the great introduction. Um, today, I'm really excited to share this uh, mission concept with you um, for outer planet exploration using ScienceCraft. Uh, ScienceCraft is a uh, integrated uh, science instrument with spacecraft to make a lightweight structure uh, that allows us, um, um, you know, very fast missions. Um, and the reason I'm interested in outer planet exploration um, is because uh, it's not only one of the key goals for NASA, but uh, in our 60 years of space exploration, outer planet uh, missions have been very limited uh, for several reasons. One, uh, extremely high cost. Second is uh, long travel time. And third is uh, the narrow window for mission implementation. Um, out of the outer planets, I'm particularly interested in Triton, which is uh, the largest moon of Neptune. Uh, it's thought to be a Kuiper Belt object that was captured by Neptune. Um, the reason I'm interested in it is because it's one of the youngest uh, surfaces in our solar system and uh, very active. It has uh, plumes, geysers, uh, it's geologically active. It has predicted oceans that we have never been able to image before. It has very energetic ionosphere, but um, um, it still has uh, more than 60% uh, surface uh, left unexplored. So it's a really uh, good target uh, for us. In fact, it was uh, um, uh, labeled as like the highest priority ocean world by the NASA Outer Planets Assessment Group. Um, however, Triton has a very narrow window for um, a traditional mission that closes around 2045 time frame because of the lighting situation, because of uh, its uh, location with respect to the sun and Neptune. And conventional propulsion would take, uh, you know, more than 14 years to get there, um, especially using, you know, um, specific locations of other planetary bodies to use gravity assist, uh, which narrows down mission implementation window. Um, another thing I wanted to uh, point out is that the recent planetary decadal that came out uh, has called uh, Uranus Orbiter and Probe as the highest priority uh, decadal mission for the next decade to be started. However, the decadal committee um, agreed that in terms of science value, Uranus and Neptune were both kind of equivalent. You know, in fact, a lot of people thought that uh, Neptune was uh, slightly more interesting given uh, Triton. However, the reason they chose uh, Uranus as the top priority was because they couldn't find a um, suitable launch opportunity for Neptune within the target time frame. And um, my goal was to think about uh, whether we could come up with a concept that addresses all of these constraints, challenges. So uh, Triton-Neptune system seemed like a um, really good system to, to demonstrate the advantages of this concept. Now, uh, solar cells have uh, the ability to go much faster as we just heard from Slava. Um, many people are looking at uh, solar cells. In fact, my co-investigator, Professor Davoyan, standing on the back, has been looking at uh, extreme solar sailing, uh, basically uh, going around the sun as a slingshot to use the higher radiation density of the sun. Uh, we can get enough propulsion to get out to Neptune Triton system in uh, just three to four years. And we don't have to get that close to the sun, actually, you know, just going to maybe a, around uh, 0.2 AU um, is enough for us. Um, however, the challenge of these solar cells is that um, they have uh, very limited uh, uh, mass uh, requirement for payloads. Uh, for example, this simulation was done with, a, with an aerial density of about five gram per meter squares. So uh, a reasonable size of solar cell can carry only so much mass and in addition to the payload, we have other um, spacecraft subsystems that we need uh, in order to have a successful mission. This is where uh, the concept of science craft uh, could be game changing in that it uh, integrates the science payload, science instrument, directly with the spacecraft into a monolithic and lightweight structure. Uh, what we do is print uh, a quantum dot spectrometer directly on the solar cell. Now, um, we could use you know, other printed instruments as well. It just turns out that 
the quantum dot spectrometer is a really nice uh, instrument in this case because for several reasons. Uh, one is that um, it, uh, it's a high throughput spectrometer that can take advantage of the large area of solar cell on one hand, and on the other hand, it can meet the stringent uh, aerial density requirements. So to give you an idea, uh, the printed quantum dots uh, in my lab have an aerial density of about you know, 30 nanogram per meter square. So that leaves us a lot of room uh, in terms of uh, aerial density. Um, also, um, we developed a process to print these quantum dots in an automated way. So that makes uh, this process quite scalable. Um, and uh, finally, this type of solar cells can be, um, are compatible with ride share opportunities. Um, so that gets around the problem of, uh, you know, having um, narrow launch opportunity. Um, so now let me talk a little bit about the quantum dot spectrometer, which is the enabling technology for this science craft. Um, the quantum dots are uh, nanometer sized crystals of semiconducting material. So for bulk uh, semiconductor material, we have uh, a continuous conduction band and continuous valence band. However, when the size of the um, particles uh, made of this semiconductor material is uh, smaller than twice its uh, exciton bore radius, we have um, uh, quantum confinement of electric charges, uh, which results in these discrete energy levels as opposed to the continuous band. And this gives us uh, a very well-defined optical property, uh, optical absorption curve for that quantum dot. Not only that, um, what happens is that once we uh, shrink the size, uh, we can tune the optical absorption curve. So uh, as the size uh, decreases, the quantum confinement strengthens. You can see these energy uh, levels kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting pushed together and an increase in uh, band gap. So uh, because of this property, we can um, uh, make uh, quantum dots with a unique set of absorption curves that are um, slightly different in wavelength, uh, even if we are using the same material, you know, just by changing the size. And that's really remarkable. Uh, so it's this set of properties that we use to make a set of filters um, that have unique absorption or transmission curves. Uh, so the idea here is that instead of using traditional um, uh, optics that are required to separate the wavelength of light, light in spectrometer like prisms or gratings, we use a set of uh, these quantum dot pixels instead. And each of these quantum dot pixels have um, a unique uh, transmission curve, uh, which we can use in wavelength multiplexing principle to, to make a spectrometer. And these pixels can be printed directly on the CCD pixels using these uh, transmission curves that are um, something we measure in the lab you know, as a one-time basis, and then we, we have it. Uh, so just using those transmission curves and the measurements and CCD pixel, we can back calculate the uh, sample spectrum we're measuring. So that's the beauty of this uh, uh, technique. And as I mentioned, um, the, the reason um, it, it's uh, quite enabling is that it gets rid of uh, op optical elements like gratings or prisms that are used in traditional spectrometers, uh, which requires long path length to achieve high spectral resolution. Initially, I was interested in this uh, uh, concept because I was uh, looking at uh, making miniaturized spectrometers, you know, something that, uh, that can fit within CubeSat or small sat. Uh, missions. However, it turns out that uh, the quantum dot spectrometer can enable other types of uh, uh, mission concepts as well, like science craft. Um, with the quantum dot spectrometer, we can um, cover a wide range of wavelengths, you know, going from uh, UV all the way to IR, uh, which is nice because that means with just this one um, instrument, we can do quite a bit of science. You know, we can do UV spectroscopy um, to look at Neptune's rings. We can um, use visible bands to do imaging. We can do uh, IR spectroscopy to look at atmospheric chemistry. Um, also, uh, another nice thing is that this can be printed on flexible substrates. So we can print on rollable solar cells 
um, that can be stored and then um, unfurled uh, after launch. Um, finally, this uh, ability to kind of customize specific wavelengths uh, allows us to uh, kind of maximize the signal to noise ratio um, for the spectrometer. So we don't necessarily have to uh, use our um, detector pixels for the entire range, you know, going from 300 to 3,000 nanometer. Instead, we can just choose a few bands to focus on. Uh, now, uh, let me share some of the recent results. Uh, the quantum dot synthesis part is something um, we, we collaborate with MIT on. Um, so uh, Professor Boyendi's group uh, does most of the quantum dot synthesis and uh, sends them to my lab. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, the details of the chemistry due to time, um, but I will share some of the results to give you an idea um, of what we are looking at. So here I have uh, optical absorption curves for uh, a bunch of quantum dots made around two specific bands. So this one around two, uh, 425 nanometer, and this one is around um, 485 nanometer. But you can see um, that we are able to uh, make precise uh, size of quantum dots um, that have a peak absorption uh, varied just by a um, little bit, you know, um, in some cases sub-nanometer, which uh, gives us a very high spectral resolution. Um, and the way we uh, make them is uh, uh, vary them in size so slightly is by uh, varying the residence time of the particles, uh, the particle synthesis process. You know, we just draw different aliquots at different uh, residence times. So here I have some TEM images of the uh, quantum dots uh, that um, our postdoc, uh, Dr. Zhu, is making. Uh, so you can see how incredibly homogeneous uh, these particles are um, in terms of size as well as in terms of shape. So once they are synthesized, uh, they are sent to my lab at uh, Goddard, and uh, we do the printing of the pixels. Um, we have developed a process to uh, print um, you know, tens of micron sized quantum dot pixels. Um, so we basically have a suspension of uh, quantum dots. Uh, we put the droplet on the substrate, then the solvent evaporates, and we're left with a cake of quantum dots. Um, this is a optical image of uh, quantum dots printed in my lab, um, same as here. We can print down to about 50 micron. We can align, uh, so we can um, print one set of quantum dots then align, print next set of quantum dots, and so on in an automated fashion. So once we have the quantum dots printed, we want to characterize the optical absorption curves from each of these pixels, which is quite challenging. But we have uh, developed a optical test setup in my lab uh, and a uh, process to, to do that. Um, once we have the set of optical curves, then we can use the wavelength multiplexing principle uh, that I was explaining earlier to um, use it as, an ex as a spectrometer. It turns out that in reality, the um, math part is not uh, as trivial as we had initially thought um, because it's a um, nonlinear equation due to some error term. Uh, but we have developed algorithm in my group to do this uh, calculation. And here I have some um, example of reconstructed spectra compared to measured spectra. So with this, we have done end-to-end um, -end demonstration of this concept of quantum dot spectrometer. This works. But this is one of the aspects of this science graph concept. Uh, in addition to the spectrometer, we are also taking advantage of uh, developments uh, made in uh, printed detectors, uh, both uh, uh, in UV as well as visible. In fact, uh, this work uh, recently done uh, showed a graphene detector that can uh, do, uh, th that can read photons going from UV all the way to IR. So this would actually work really well for our spectrometer. Uh, we are also uh, taking advantage of uh, the work that has been done in thin film electronics because um, the idea is that we will print the thin film electronics along with detector and the spectrometer on the solar cell. Uh, 
in addition to that, there are you know, several other challenges that we are looking at as part of uh, our current effort, including thermal management. You know, when we get to um, get close to the sun, how we um, keep the spectrometer part uh, still at lower temperature. Um, and my co-investigator, uh, Professor Davoyan, is looking at that. Oops. Sorry, I keep uh, pressing the next button instead of the laser button. Um, also, uh, power is an um, important consideration because in other planets, we don't really have uh, that much solar power, so we can't really use solar cells very efficiently. Uh, and of course, we are looking at uh, communications, you know, ways to send our data back to Earth. Um, finally, I want to conclude uh, with uh, the following message that uh, science craft can be a game-changing concept uh, that leverages you know, several cutting-edge technologies developed in recent years um, and provides a um, low-cost, uh, low-resource platform for outer planet exploration. Um, in this case, we demonstrate you know, the concept with quantum dot spectrometer because um, it, as I mentioned, you know, on, on one hand, um, it uses the large area of solar cell, and the, on, a, on the other hand, it provides a very small aerial density. However, in the future, we can um, take advantage of developments in uh, printing process for other materials, other structures, uh, to, to use other instruments in, in similar ways. Um, also, this, the methodology we're using to, to make this uh, science craft is scalable, so we can um, use constellation fairly easily. Um, even for a flyby mission, you know, we will be able to uh, image cover quite a bit of uh, surface of Triton and Neptune. So that's, that's really uh, nice. Um, in summary, uh, we believe that science craft provides a solution for um, most of the key challenges of outer planet exploration that has you know, prevented us uh, in the past by providing fast transit, short lead time, uh, more launch opportunities, and therefore getting around that issue of narrow mission implementation. So the beauty of this concept, I think, is that even if it takes us you know, 10 years, let's say, to uh, develop the technologies needed and launch it, we can still meet the narrow window of uh, Triton's uh, mission implementation. So I think that kind of highlights you know, the, um, the big advantage of this type of concept we'll have. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that uh, you know, this is a collaboration between um, UCLA and Goddard. Uh, Professor Davoyan uh, is in the back. Uh, also, we have a team of uh, engineers at Goddard uh, who is working with me, and the quantum dot synthesis part is a collaboration with MIT and the funding sources. Uh, currently, it's funded by NIAC. Uh, previously, it was funded by IRAD. And the spectrometer part was funded by ROSES. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and if anyone has um, thoughts or ideas uh, on how we can make this better or apply it to other concepts, um, I'll be very happy to discuss.